Hey there! Welcome to Clean Cut and Let's Talk About the Truth. This is where we can talk about life, reality, and anything else. There's just one rule. We have to use solid logic and common sense. This season, we'll be discussing the early councils of the Church and how doctrine developed in those early times. Officially, there have been 21 ecumenical councils in Church history, but I think the first 10 will be enough for this season. Today, we'll be discussing the third official ecumenical council, the Council at Ephesus. At this period in history, 431 AD, the Archbishop of Constantinople, Nestorius by name, was promoting the view that Jesus' natures, divine and human, weren't really united in the sense where statements made about Jesus could necessarily be made about both of his natures. In particular, he proposed that Mary gave birth not to God, but only to the human nature of Jesus. This is a problem, because women don't give birth to natures, they give birth to people. Just as I can't say, I picked the nature of a lily, and be telling the truth, so the actions done to Jesus were done to him as a person, not as a nature. St. Cyril recognized these critical weaknesses in the position of Nestorius, and urged the Pope of the time, Pope St. Celestine, to take action. He did, issuing an ultimatum, ordering that if Nestorius didn't recant his view within ten days, he should be deposed and excommunicated. In response, Nestorius appealed to the emperor, a benefactor of his, to call another council, and the pope agreed. So the central cause of the Council of Ephesus was the Nestorian controversy. However, it wasn't the only issue dealt with at the council itself. One of the things that almost all ecumenical councils have done is to issue what are called anathemas. These are condemnations of certain views and positions which are declared contrary to the true faith, and it's through these anathemas that one can tell what exactly the core message of a council is, which Catholics need to be aware of. To defy any of the anathemas of the Church knowingly is to depart willingly from the truths of God, and the very first anathema of this council was against the Nestorian position, establishing that Jesus is truly God, and so Mary, being his mother and bearing him, is in fact the mother of God. This is important less because of what it says about Mary than what it says about Jesus. There are only two ways to deny that Mary is the mother of God without disputing what the Bible overtly says about Jesus being her son, and both require doubting that Jesus is God in some way, either denying his divinity overtly, like the Arians, or muddling the truth with false distinctions, as Nestorius did. At this point, both had been condemned. Therefore, it was a settled matter that Jesus is God, the most important of the truths that we as Christians rely on, apart from the existence of God in general. The anathemas of the Council established several other things as well, that Jesus' human and divine natures were not separate, but united in one person, and not to be divided again, that the words and descriptions of Jesus weren't to be attributed only to one nature, in a way that implies isolation from the other, that Jesus was not merely a man bearing God, but truly God, that the word of God wasn't the master of Jesus, nor did the word of God activate Jesus, clothing him in divine attributes that weren't proper to him. Jesus' human nature isn't to be worshipped separate from God because it's not separate from God. The power Jesus displayed after being descended on by the Holy Spirit wasn't some alien influence from a separate thing, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, and it's proper for him to have it. The word of God that John speaks about in John chapter 1 is Jesus in reality. And he made his sacrifice on the cross only for our sins, not for his own, because Jesus never committed any sins. The body of Jesus is his proper body and doesn't belong even partly to anyone else. Finally, the word of God suffered, was crucified, tasted death, and returned to life all in the flesh and all without ceasing to be life himself. John 14:6. I am the way and the truth and the life. This establishes Jesus as God and therefore his mother as the mother of God. In addition to these fine points in refutation of Nestorianism, the council also dealt with a few other issues. It declared that it was not permitted to produce or write or compose any other creed apart from the Nicene Creed. This means new creeds for the church are not to be invented after this date. It doesn't say, however, that no other creed is to be used, and other creeds did exist at the time, primarily the same ones we have today. The Apostles' Creed and what's sometimes called the Athanasian Creed both have their origins long before this council in 431 AD. 
Also, the views of Pelagius were condemned at this council as well. His position was essentially that people could fulfill the law of God perfectly without any further supernatural aid and didn't require special invisible grace from God in order to be saved from their sinful nature. That view was also condemned. If we could save ourselves, Jesus wouldn't have needed to die on the cross in the first place. Of course, as with most of these councils, they established what the truth was, but people who were mistaken would stubbornly continue being mistaken for a long time after that. Still, progress was made, and the truth about the identity and attributes of Jesus were further developed by this council, though, sadly, there was still plenty of room for confusion, as we'll see next time. Next, the Council of Chalcedon. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.